owner? Is there going to be anyone else on the system? Just him. Just him. Right. Just him. 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 Special report. Now reporting, George Stephanopoulos. Good morning. We are coming on the air right now because we are about to hear for the first time since he was appointed more than two years ago from special counsel Robert Mueller, the head of the Russia investigation. Now more than two months since he delivered his final report on the investigation of the Attorney General William Barr. You see that podium there in the Justice Department where the Robert Mueller is expected to speak in just moments. Our Pierre Thomas is there. Pierre, what do we know about what we're going to hear right now? Well, George, a lot of anticipation here. We've not heard from this man in over two years, said nothing as the investigation unfolded, speaking only in court. Uh, there has been a lot of conversation about whether he has to testify before Congress. Uh, our sources have been saying that he's been extremely reluctant to do that, that he did not want to engage in a political circus. So we'll find out soon directly from Mueller. Speaking at the Justice Department, the Attorney General William Barr does know, has authorized this press conference. We're also told that the White House was given a heads up last night uh, about this statement coming. Do not know, Cecilia Vega, here with me, whether they got any heads up on the substance of what was given, of, of what Robert Mueller is going to say. Yeah, and, and in fact, I, I would assume they're all in the White House watching this pretty closely today. Uh, this comes, it's worth pointing out, George, just days after the president was there in the Rose Garden with that pretty extraordinary event where he had those signs printed that said, no conclusion, no And instruction. here comes Robert Mueller now. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Two years ago, the acting attorney general asked me to serve as special counsel, and he created the special counsel's office. The appointment order directed the office to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. This included investigating any links or coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Now, I have not spoken publicly during our investigation. I'm speaking out today because our investigation is complete. The Attorney General has made the report on our investigation largely public. We are formally closing the special counsel's office. And as well, I'm resigning from the Department of Justice to return to private life. I'll make a few remarks about the results of our work. But beyond these few remarks, it is important that the office's written work speak for itself. Let me begin where the appointment order begins, and that is interference in the 2016 presidential election. As alleged by the grand jury in an indictment, Russian intelligence officers who were part of the Russian military launched a concerted attack on our political system. The indictment alleges that they used sophisticated cyber techniques to hack into computers and networks used by the Clinton campaign. They stole private information and then released that information through fake online and identities and through the organization WikiLeaks. The releases were designed and timed to interfere with our election and to damage a presidential candidate. And at the same time as the grand jury alleged in a separate indictment, a private Russian entity engaged in a social media operation where Russian citizens posed as Americans in order to influence an, an election. These indictments contain alleg allegations, and we are not co commenting on the guilt or the innocence of any specific defendant. Every defendant is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. The indictments allege, and the other activities in our report describe, efforts to interfere in our political system. They needed to be investigated and understood, and that is among the reasons why the Department of Justice established our office. That is also a reason we investigated efforts to obstruct the investigation. The matters we investigated were of paramount importance. It was critical for us to obtain full and accurate information from every person we questioned. 
when a subject of an investigation obstructs that investigation or lies to investigators, it strikes at the core of their government's effort to find the truth and hold wrongdoers accountable. Let me say a word about the report. The report has two parts addressing the two main issues we were asked to investigate. The first volume of the report details numerous efforts emanating from Russia to influence the election. This volume includes a discussion of the Trump campaign's response to this activity, as well as our conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to charge a broader conspiracy. And in the second volume, the report describes the results and analysis of our obstruction of justice investigation involving the president. The order appointing me special counsel authorized us to investigate actions that could obstruct the investigation. And we conducted that investigation and we kept the office of the acting attorney general apprised of the progress of our work. And as set forth in the report after that investigation, if we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. The introduction to the volume two of our report explains that decision. It explains that under long-standing department policy, a president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That is unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that too is prohibited. The special counsel's office is part of the Department of Justice and by regulation, it was bound by that department policy. Charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. The department's written opinion explaining the policy makes several important points that further informed our handling of the obstruction investigation. Those points are summarized in our report and I will describe two of them for you. First, the opinion expli explicitly permits the investigation of a sitting president because it is important to preserve evidence while memories are fresh and documents available. Among other things, that evidence could be used if there were co-conspirators who could be charged now. And second, the opinion says that the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. And beyond department policy, we were guided by principles of fairness. It would be unfair to potentially it would be unfair to potentially accuse somebody of a crime when there can be no court resolution of the actual charge. So that was Justice Department policy. Those were the principles under which we operated. And from them, we concluded that we would, would not reach a determination one way or the other about whether the president committed a crime. That is the office's, that is the office's final position and we will not comment on any other conclusions or hypotheticals about the president. We conducted an independent criminal investigation and reported the results to the attorney general as required by department regulations. The attorney general then concluded that it was appropriate to provide our report to Congress and to the American people. At one point in time, I requested that certain portions of the report be released the Attorney General preferred to, make that, preferred to make the entire report public all at once. And we appreciate that the Attorney General made the report largely public. And I certainly do not question the Attorney General's good faith in that decision. Now I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. I am making that decision myself. No one has told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about this matter. There has been discussion about an appearance before Congress. Any testimony from this office would not go beyond our report. It contains our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully and the work speaks for itself. 
and the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. In addition, access to our underlying work product is being decided in a process that does, that does not involve our office. So beyond what I've said here today and what is contained in our written work, I do not believe it is appropriate for me to speak further about the investigation or to comment on the actions of the Justice Department or Congress. And it's for that reason I will not be taking questions today as well. Now before I step away, I want to thank the attorneys, the FBI agents, the analysts, the professional staff who helped us conduct this investigation in a fair and independent manner. These individuals who spent nearly two years with the special counsel's office were of the highest integrity. And I will close by reiterating the central allegation of our indictments that there were multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election. And that allegation deserves the attention of every American. Thank you, thank you for being here today. And there you have it. The first and final words from Special Counsel Robert Mueller. The first times he has spoken since he was appointed special counsel more than two years ago, and the last time, according to the special counsel, that he will speak. He says he is closing his office, formally resigning from the Department of Justice, returning to private life, also says he will, does not intend to testify to Congress, that his report speaks for itself, and this is a decision he has reached on his own. Also laid out, again, some of the conclusions of that report, laying out systematic interference in our elections by the Russians, saying this is a serious matter. Also laying out that he did not find sufficient evidence, there was insufficient evidence to conclude that the Trump, Trump campaign or President Trump himself participated in a conspiracy with the Russians. Also explaining why he did not reach a decision on whether or not the president obstructed justice, saying this is a decision he could not reach. A lot to talk about here, a lot to go through. I want to start out with our chief White House correspondent, John Carl. What we did not hear from the special counsel right there in his first and final words are those four words we've heard so often from the president. No collusion, no obstruction. Uh, absolutely, George. And you point out that he said that prosecuting the president was not an option he had because of Department of Justice policies. He could not have drawn up an indictment against the president. But the second thing he said was very significant. He said, if we had confidence the president did not commit a crime, we would have said so. So what you did not hear, as you point out, he did not say that the president was exonerated. He did not say uh, no collusion, no obstruction. And George, he also referred to other processes that uh, would, would be, uh, that would take place beyond the criminal justice system uh, to hold a president accountable. He didn't use the word uh, impeachment, but it seemed to me that the implication was that, uh, that this would be a matter for Congress to decide, uh, certainly not the Department of Justice. That certainly did seem to be an implication. I want to bring in our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, on this as well. Dan, the special counsel said the report speaks for itself, but this was actually the clearest statement yet we've heard from special counsel Robert Mueller on why he did not reach that decision on obstruction of justice by the president. Exactly. Instead of 448 pages, you've got a few minutes of him highlighting what he thinks are the most important things to look at. And when he's focusing on in the obstruction area, and that's where he spent the, mo the majority of his time, is talking about that obstruction section of his report. And as Jonathan points out, saying that charging the president uh, was not an option. Uh, that uh, there's something other than the criminal justice system would have to hold a president accountable. But the most important thing that I heard was he said, as a result, we would not make a decision. He didn't say could not. Well, he actually he said, said both. He said could not and would not. Well, <laughs> no, no. He first, first said he first said it was not an option we could consider. Then he said the words would right. twice. We would, and he emphasized it, would not make a decision. That is very different from an inability to make a decision. And I think he was making it very clear that that was not the issue. The issue was not that they, that they were unable to decide here, but they made a concerted decision not to do that. 
for the reasons laid out in that introduction. Well, okay, no, okay, now I, now I see exactly what you're saying. What he's saying is, first of all, once you consider Department of Justice policy, you almost can't even get to the exactly. question. Exactly. Exactly, and he's, he's emphasizing that. He, he said the words would twice. We would, would not make a decision on that. And, and I think he's making a clear statement that, that please don't misunderstand this to say, you know, we threw up our arms or we punted to the attorney general. He was saying we intentionally didn't do this because, A, we thought it was department policy that you cannot indict a sitting president and that there has to be another entity that holds any president um, accountable. One more question and, on, yeah. on that, and then I want to bring in Chris Christie on the same question. That does seem, and he was silent on this notion that uh, William Barr saying he had to step in and make the decision. Uh, that silence actually speaks volumes, because when you actually look at the plain meaning of what special counsel Robert Mueller is saying here is that he says he was following Department of Justice policy by implication, the attorney general wasn't? Well, I, it, that, that is, by implication. Uh, look, the, the, the problem is, the difference is you can clear someone, right? As Mueller, he didn't clear him. He effectively said that there wasn't enough evidence to charge on the conspiracy, right? And he said, if we could find that in the obstruction section, we would have said it. But we couldn't, so we didn't. Um, and, and then, but by highlighting that, again, it, it's important to note, He's got, what, seven or eight minutes, however long he was talking here. It's important to think about what was he focusing on here. And he's focusing on why he couldn't do anything on obstruction. Um, this is the same thing we've talked about, it, and he referred to that introduction, which is the critical section in the obstruction. It's the beginning of it. He laid out four reasons, basically, why the investigation uh, is legitimate and why the president, A, can't be charged, and B, you can't even accuse the president of anything in the report, according to uh, Robert Mueller. But the fact that he's emphasizing the multiple systematic efforts to impact the election made it clear that Hillary Clinton was the target of that, and the effort was effectively to harm her Chris, campaign, and then to focus on the obstruction section. Chris, Chris Christie, so Democrats are not going to be happy with this decision by Robert Mueller not to testify before the Congress, saying he doesn't want to do that. But clearly, some daylight here between what Robert Mueller is saying about his report and what the Attorney General said about the report, what the President has said about the report. Sure, that's, that's absolutely clear, and Bob Mueller made that clear this morning. I think, George, the point that people should really focus on here is the difference between Bob Mueller and Jim Comey. Now, both men were confronted with these kind of choices and department policy. Bob Mueller played today like an absolute Boy Scout. He said only what was legally and by, and by policy permissible to say. He's letting his report speak for itself, um, and he's not going to go any further. Contrast that to the summer of 2016. When Jim Comey came out and appointed himself attorney general, deputy attorney general, special counsel, and FBI director, and trashed Hillary Clinton um, without charging her, um, violated department policy. Um, I think that, you know, you see a contrast with leaders of the Justice Department. Bob Mueller is someone who's to be respected and, and who is to be admired. And the contrast with Jim Comey, his successor as FBI director, is so incredibly stark after today's comments that, quite frankly, Comey should be ashamed of himself. Uh, Chris Christie, thanks very much. I want to bring in our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas, for more on this uh, as well. And, Pierre, you cover the Justice Department every day. You've covered Robert Mueller. You covered William Barr. Two very different stories here. Exactly, George. I was struck by the fact that Mueller went out of his way to talk about Justice Department policy. And that policy is that a sitting president cannot be charged. And Mueller said it would be unfair to make a resolution uh, to come to a, a determination as to whether charges should be filed. That's in direct contrast to what the attorney general did. He did make the call, and he has criticized Mueller for making that call. So a stark contrast there, George. The other thing that struck me in looking at Mueller today is that he emphasized over and over again that the report speaks for itself. And our sources were telling us for the last several weeks, and we reported on uh, your show and others, that Mueller was very concerned about being called before Congress, not being able to talk beyond the report, and that it would descend into some sort of political circus. He did not want to be a part of that, but 
He wanted to make sure today that he came out, stated the points that he wanted to make about that there was Russian interference, that it was a serious matter, it was designed to hurt one candidate and hurt another, and that he read that part from the report that struck me. If we could make a determination that a crime was not committed definitively, we would so state, George. And you have to com compare, combine that with Pierre. Thanks very much. I'm going to bring in Cecilia Vega for more on this point. He chose to summarize this report today in those few minutes and the points that he thought were most important among them. He doesn't have uh, sufficient evidence to charge a conspiracy, couldn't make a final de decision on obstruction, and then, as John Carl pointed out earlier, also said there are other processes available. That is, Congress increases the pressure on the House Speaker for impeachment. Oh, it certainly does, and these calls from Democrats for impeachment in the House have been growing louder by the day, and many of those Democrats have said that they were waiting to hear from Mueller specifically to decide on impeachment, so this certainly increases the pressure on Nancy Pelosi. And, and I've got to say, you talked about the way that Mueller summarized this. I think one of the big takeaways here, and the president is not going to be happy about this, is that you now have the investigator on camera for the first time in a very concise, clear soundbite saying, we did not determine whether the president committed a crime. That doesn't look good for him, and that certainly is going to be ammunition for the Democrats going forward. That'll be ammunition for the Democrats. I want to bring in uh, Terry Moran, also our chief national correspondent uh, here. Robert Mueller, by the book, a uh, more than 40-year career in Washington as FBI director, leaves public life as the special counsel, as the way he came in, again, by the book, but threw a lot of ammunition out there for both sides. He surely did. Uh, by the book, uh, he hopes it's the last time. But, uh, he is definitely still in the crosshairs of Congress for some kind of testimony, though he made clear he wouldn't say anything further than what he did today, but that was quite a lot, as you are saying. This was actually a sharper edge than the report, if you look at how he arranged it. If we had evidence that could have cleared the president's we, of committing a crime, we would have said so. And then that absolutely crucial line that you've been talking about, the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a president of wrongdoing. And you look at the report laying out those instances of possible obstruction of justice. This is Robert Mueller saying to Congress, do your job. It is time to take this up. And there isn't much of an appetite for it, not even in the Democratic Party. Just 25 or so Democratic members out of 235 have come out for impeachment. But essentially what this is saying, right up to the conclusion uh, that must be drawn from what Robert Mueller said, if Donald Trump wasn't president of the United States, he'd be charged with a crime. And what he's saying, Terry Moran, thanks very much. I want to bring in John Carl on this as well, is what he's also saying when he says the report speaks for itself, John Carl, is read that section two on obstruction, members of Congress, come to your conclusions. Exactly, and it also directly contradicts on that point what Attorney General uh, William Barr said. Barr, uh, in his comments, had said that the special counsel uh, left it up to the Department of Justice to make that uh, determination. And what he is saying here explicitly and without any hesitation is that, that the uh, Constitution requires processes other than the criminal justice system to accuse a sitting president. In other words, it would not have been up to the attorney general. The only other process that is conceived in the Constitution is an impeachment process. So if there were to be a determination whether or not what he outlined in that part two of his report regarding uh, uh, obstruction of justice, it would be up to Congress to decide whether or not that amounts uh, to uh, to to uh, activity that would be a high crime misdemeanor. So, Chris Christie, I want to bring you in on this as well. Thank you, John. This has been taken away now from the legal processes. That's the word that that uh, Robert Mueller used, and being put right back in to the political arena. Yeah, it is. And, and listen, I do think that those comments by Bob Mueller about in, you know the other processes, obviously impeachment. Um, being the only constitutional way to accuse the president of wrongdoing um, definitely contradicts what the attorney general said um, when he summarized uh, Mueller's report uh, and said that he then had to draw the conclusion on that. Um, Mueller clearly contradicts that today in a very concise way. And, and I think also now, at the end of this, um, it's kind of what a number of us, Dan and I, have been saying all along, that... And the obstruction issue, this was never going to be a Department of Justice or special counsel call. In the end, on a sitting president, this is the call of the Congress playing their role as a co-equal branch of government. And they're now going to have to decide 
what it is they want to do. And Dan, let's go, let's let's take it to the next step then, and look at those ten incidents that. Uh, or so incidents that Robert Mueller did outline in his report laying out possible evidence of obstruction of justice. Is this something Congress can ignore? Well, look, and, and some of them are certainly stronger than others. And, and I think in some cases he's making it clear that he doesn't think that there was enough to find obstruction. But particularly when it comes to Don McGahn, in particular with uh, what the special counsel found was really the president